welcome to tonight's performance of The, the Complete Works of William Shakespeare, Abridged. By Adam Long, Daniel Singer, and Jess Winfield. Before we begin, I have a few brief announcements. The use of flash photography and recording by any means audio or video is strictly prohibited by the management. Also, please take this time to locate the exits nearest your seat. Should the theater experience a sudden loss in air pressure, oxygen masks will fall, from, will fall automatically. So to place the mask over your nose and mouth and continue to breathe normally. If you are at the theater with a small child, please place your own mask on first and with a little bugger friend for himself. <laughs> Allow me to introduce myself. I am Daniel. And my partner and I are going to are going to attempt to feed that we believe to be unprecedented in the history of theater. That is to capture in a single theatrical event. The magic, the grandeur, the towering genius of the complete works of William Shakespeare. Now we have a lot to get through tonight, so at this time I'd like to introduce a gentleman to the stage who is perhaps one of America's preeminent Shakespearean scholars. He has a bachelor's degree at the California U University of California, Berkeley, where I believe he has read two books about William Shakespeare. <laughs> he is here tonight to provide a brief biography of William Shakespeare. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Adam Law. Oh, oh. Here, no, no, wait, hold on, don't touch him. It's like they go in and work. Oh. Um, hi, so um, I've just been taking some notes on Shakespeare's life, just so like we can get the show off to a good start, and you can know the stuff that he did and everything, so. Okay, um, <clears throat> William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was born in 1564 in the town of Stratford upon Ethan Warwickshire. The third of eight children, he was the eldest son of John Shakespeare, a locally prominent merchant, and, the, and Mary Arden, the daughter of a Roman. Catholic member of the landed gentry. In 1582, he married Anne Hathaway, a farmer's daughter. Shakespeare arrived in London in 1588, and by 1592, he had achieved much success as an actor and a playwright. After 1608, his dramatic production lessened, and it seems that he spent more time in Stratford. There, he dictated to his secretary, Rudolf Hess, the work Mein Kampf, in which he set forth his program for the restoration of Germany to a dominant position in Europe. Uh, after reoccupying the Rhineland zone between France and Germany and annexing Austria, the Sudetenland, and Czechoslovakia, Shakespeare invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, thus precipitating World War II. Did you know that? I didn't know. Okay, um, Shakespeare remained in Berlin until the Russians entered the city and then he committed suicide with his mistress, Ava Throne. <laughs> oh my gosh. He was buried in the church of Stratford. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we are proud to prevent the complete works of William Shakespeare, a bridge. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and <laughs> entrances. And one man in his time has many parts. One man in his time has many parts. How true. Ladies and gentlemen, we're better to begin our exploration of the complete works of William Shakespeare than to begin by exploring the genius evidence in Shakespeare's more mature plays as we present the dark and brooding tragedy of Othello, the Moor of Venice. Ooh. Ooh. Speak of me as I am. Let nothing extenuate to one who loved not wisely, but too well. For never was there a story of more woe than that of Othello and his dead Oh, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we love to on his own to research this play tonight, and he seems to have looked up more in the dictionary and thought it was a place for you tie up folks, which in this context is completely pay brain. <laughs> you see, in the 16th century, more was a word to describe someone of African descent. Oh, I feel like such a dork now. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we obviously have some problem in even performing a fellow. What I mean to say is that due to a lack of our physical characteristics, basically due to physical limitations, we are unable to perform a fellow to more Venice. So we will be no, wait, hold on. We can still do it. Like, just because we're white doesn't mean we can do a fellow. I have no idea. No, I, I don't know. No, but seriously, okay, it's better than the boats, okay, really. So, like, just kind of join in. Oh, no. I don't no. want to look well, why don't they call a fellow? You like white women and you like to Shakespeare was a genius at 
borrowing and adapting various plots events from different theatrical traditions. These traditions include the Roman plays of Plautius and Terence, Ovid's Metamorphoses, which are hysterically funny, not, <laughs> and the Italian traditions of Com Commedia dell'arte. Yeah, basically, Shakespeare stole everything he ever wrote. Stole is kind of strong. Distilled, maybe. <laughs> okay, then he distilled three or four of the funniest gimmicks of his time and milked them into 16 plays. You see, Shakespeare was essentially a uh, formula writer. Once he found something that worked, he used it over and over and over again. So, Mr. Shakespeare, the question we have for you is this. Why did you write 16 comedies when you could have written just, just one? In answer to this question, my partner and I take the liberty of condensing all 16 of Shakespeare's plays into one single comedy, which we have entitled Two Women, Ladies and Gentlemen, Lost in Mary Boys of Venice on a summer's night and winter. Or Simply Taming Pericles and Merchant in a Tempest of Love as much as you like it for nothing. Or The Love Boat Goes to Verona. <laughs> Act 1. A Spanish duke swears an oath of celibacy and turns the rule of his kingdom over to a sadistic and tyrannical twin brother. He learns some fantastical feats of magic and sets sail for the Golden Age of Greece, taking with him his daughters three beautiful sets of identical twins. <laughs> As he was riding the heel of Italy, the Duke ship is caught in a terrible tempest, which, in its fury, casts the Duke and the loveliest of his daughters into a deserted island. Act 2. The low lost children of the Duke's brother, also coincidentally with <coughs> the sense of identical twins, have just arrived in Italy. Although still possessed of an inner nobility, they are ragged, destitute, penniless, fully infested shadows of the men they once were, and in the utmost extremity are forced to borrow money from an old Jew who deceives them into putting down their brains as collateral on the loan. <laughs> Meanwhile, the six brothers fall in love with six Italian sisters. Three of whom are contentious, sharp-tongued little shrews, while the other three are submissive, air-headed little bimbos. <laughs> Act three. The shipwrecked daughters of the Duke wash up on the shores of Italy, disguise themselves as men, become pages to the shrews, and matchmakers to the Duke's brother's sons. They lead all the lovers into a nearby forest, where on a midsummer's night, much of mischievous fairy squeeze the juice of the flower into the eyes of the shrews, causing them to fall in love with the pages, who in turn fall in love with the Duke's brother's sons. Act four. The elderly Duke, recognizing his daughters are missing, send messages to the pages, telling them to kill all men in the vicinity. However, unable to find any men in the force, the faithful uh, messengers in a final misguided act of loyalty deliver the messages to each other and kill themselves. Oh. Act 5. Act 5. The, the Duke commands to right the wrong. The pages of the bimbos get into a knockdown, drag out fight in the mud. The, the Duke recognizes his daughters. The Duke's brother sons recognize their uncle. They all get married and go out for dinner. Except for a minor character in the second act who gets eaten by a bear and the Duke's brother son who, unable to pay back the old Jew, get themselves a lobotomy. And they all live happily ever after. Okay, so now basically, we're going to move back to the tragedies, because we found out that the comedies aren't half as funny as the tragedies. <laughs> Take, for example, Shakespeare's Scottish play, Macbeth. Not only are we able to perform an abbreviated version of Macbeth, but after much thorough research, we are able to do so in perfect Scottish accents. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. And this has been the complete works of William Shakespeare, abridged. Wait, 